Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church. We're glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. A few announcements to share with you. Uh, we are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon. And here are some ways you can be part of that mission. First, I uh, plan to attend the church council meeting on May 22nd at 5.30. This will be a special time where I will be sharing about my experience of the past year. Can you believe it's almost been a year now uh, that I've been here? And then I'm going to be sharing with you uh, where I see us headed in the future. So I hope that you'll make plans to be a part of that church council meeting. There's a link there to sign up. We're going to be having dinner. Uh, and so you can sign up, let us know you're coming. It is vital to let us know that you will be here so we can make sure we have uh, the right amount of food. Second, uh, make sure you mark your calendars for our Vacation Bible School dates. You see those there, June 19th through June 23rd. Uh, and invite all the folks you know to come and be part of that. We're going to have a great time. I'm going to be a puppet again. That was a highlight of last year. Uh, and I'm looking forward to being the puppet for this year. Uh, third, uh, our Senior Recognition Sunday is coming up in two weeks. And you see there's a request there for information. Uh, about our graduates, including we would like to be able to put in the bulletin if you have completed some sort of degree, post-secondary degree, uh, since uh, this past May, we would love to be able to recognize you just in the bulletin with a little note. So let us know about that and we'll be sure to recognize you. Finally, Mother's Day is next Sunday, uh, and we usually have a habit of having lunch on the second Sunday of the month, uh, but knowing that lots of folks like to have lunch with their moms afterwards, uh, we will instead be having a brunch. So 9.30 in the morning, bring your breakfast casseroles. We'll have a chance to mill around and hang out, and then you can take whatever you may have not eaten already to Sunday school with you at 10. So 9.30 next week, our second Sunday brunch for Mother's Day. We have gathered to worship God, and so let us turn our hearts and our minds and our attention, all that we are and all that we have, to the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Praise the Lord who has shown us the wonders of his unfailing love, and who, for the sake of his name, leads us and guides us. In you, O Lord, we put our trust. You are our God, and our lives are in your hands. Lord, let the light of your face shine on us as we celebrate together in your presence. Amen. Amen.
invite you to remain standing as we, trusting in the character and the competence of God, say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
As you can imagine, ahead of the council meeting on the 22nd, I've been doing a lot of reflecting. And one of the things I'm reflecting on is what an honor and privilege it is to preach here and to preach to you. And I thank you for your attention and the ways that you respond uh, to the preaching you hear from this pulpit. As we approach this time of preaching, let us pray. God, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. A couple of years ago, we as a family had a terribly important decision to make. It was one of those life-changing decisions, one where the impacts would be far-reaching regardless of which way we decided to go. It was one of those moments where the threads in life intersect and to move forward, you must decide which thread to follow. How did we make the decision? Prayerfully, first and foremost, with silence and listening to God, another form of prayer, and then through calling people whose opinions I respect, people who have had an important impact on my life, people who are farther down the road of life than I am and who have an uncommon wisdom to show for it. In other words, I called my mentors. And to a person, they all gave the same advice without having consulted with each other. They helped Dana and I clarify which way was the right way to go. After speaking with all of them, the decision before us became easier. That's the power of having mentors. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person does another. Here in these phone calls to mentors was just such a case. We've all known people who have influenced our lives. Those who have had a positive influence we often call mentors. I'm sure that we have also been mentors, many of us, ourselves. A deep honor and privilege to walk alongside someone's journey, offering wisdom and guidance to build up that person. Sometimes, that mentoring is so influential, it causes the mentee to take up your mantle, to walk in your shoes. Perhaps some of you have known this in turning over the family business to a relative or close friend, or having your mentee follow you into your career, or any of another many numerous ways in which someone who came behind you picked up your life's work, your life's purpose, your mantle, and kept going. Or perhaps you are the one who picked up someone else's mantle and kept going, having been mentored ahead of such a privilege. That's exactly what happens in our story this morning. Elisha picks up Elijah's mantle and keeps going. As he walks with Elijah in our scripture this morning, he knows that he will soon inherit Elijah's work. And that's a big job. Elijah's work is speaking truth to power, especially to a power that usually doesn't want to hear the truth. That is often an unpleasant and even dangerous task. And yet he will do it, picking up Elijah's mantle. Let's hear that story together. It comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, the first 14 verses. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, 
as the Lord lives and as you yourself live. I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted on one side and then to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Elijah responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see Elijah, Elisha grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and then to the other, and Elisha went over. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As iron sharpens iron, so one person does another. Elisha rips his clothes, an old school sign of mourning. He's deeply sad that his mentor is gone. Even though he stood amazed at the way that his mentor went, still a major, important, deeply valued relationship in his life is gone. Elijah spent much time raising up Elisha to pick up his mantle, to take on the role when Elijah was gone. They walked together. They shared the journey of life together, Elijah telling Elisha all he needed to know. At the start, in 1 Kings 19, Elisha seems like an overly eager child, wanting so badly to be like Elijah. But here, when we reach this moment in the scripture, Elijah's mentoring has had its impact. Elisha is more mature, has proper understanding of his role, or understanding formed and shaped by Elijah's presence in his life. As iron sharpens iron, so Elijah sharpened Elisha. That's what mentoring does. Consider mentors in your life. Who comes to mind? Maybe a teacher or an old college professor? Maybe someone who showed you the ropes of your profession as you were getting started? Maybe someone who came along later in life at just the right moment to help you make sense of that season of life. I remember sitting in a classroom at James Madison University as I was pursuing a graduate degree in counseling. That particular class taught group counseling by practicing group counseling. And I came in hot one day and I just started unloading. It was a safe space to do that. Somehow, and I'm not exactly sure I remember how, the conversation became about a shared love the professor and I had of former U.S. President Harry Truman. The professor was from Missouri and had worked as a college student cataloging all the papers from the Truman administration in preparation for opening his presidential library. That particular day was super encouraging and I left feeling like I had been given a gift just from being in that conversation, but days later, in my inter-office mailbox, there was a large envelope. Inside was a set of first edition, a first edition set of the memoirs of Harry Truman, given to me by my professor. Inside, he wrote, Ted, these were given to me many years ago. It would please me to know that you will carry them on in years to come. Fondly, Jack. It was a wonderful, extraordinary gift and one that I still cherish to this day. It fostered a relationship that lasted for a season, but one which taught me many things about how to interact with colleagues, students, and now church members. Those first editions sit on the mantle of our fireplace, along with a couple other special books, a reminder of the impact of Jack Presbury 
on my life. Sometimes mentors are for a season. Sometimes they're for much longer, but always there's an indelible impact. Think in your life of those who have mentored you. Think of the time they invested, the care and concern that they showed for you personally. That could be a parent, like a close relative or an uncle or aunt. It could be a professional in your field or a former owner of your business. It could be an old teacher or professor. It could be anyone who showed deep care and concern for your life and then chose to invest her or himself in you. What mentor comes to mind? In my life, I could name several people who have had such an impact, sometimes for a season, sometimes over a longer period. One person especially comes to mind for me. She has been such a blessing, and I am a better person because of her presence in my life. But our relationship did not begin all that well. She hired me to work at Mercer, and things were a bit rocky to start. I was obstinate. I was full of myself. I was convinced I could do everyone's job better than they could. In other words, I was pretty typical for being right out of graduate school. But she kept reaching out. She kept the channel of relationship open. And over the course of months, our relationship grew to one of fondness and respect. Then one day, as I came in to give her a purchase order to sign, she asked me if I'd ever considered becoming a pastor. She knew I had an inner wrestling going on, and she knew I was searching for something, and she thought about this idea on one of her frequent morning runs, which were both exercise and time of prayer for her. That conversation launched me into ministry, even to the point you see me today. As I was leaving my job at Mercer to take my first appointment, she asked me in her own funny way if she could continue to meet with me on a regular basis. Those meetings became mentoring conversations. And even though she now lives in Florida, all these years later, we continue to meet together, and she continues to be a mentor for me. In some ways, especially as a professional, I have picked up her mantle, taking it with me into how I engage my job, my colleagues, and the communities I serve. As iron sharpens iron, so our mentors have shaped us. Presence is key. Time invested through presence leaves a lasting effect on the people we mentor and on ourselves when we are the mentee. Elisha knew that. Scripture doesn't tell us, but Elijah certainly had a mentor who raised him up in the ways that he should go, and Elisha undoubtedly mentored someone else to take up his mantle when he was gone. The succession matters because the work that Elijah did, the work that Elisha took on, was work being done before Elijah took it on, and was work being done even up to this day after Elisha. There are those in the world, I have no doubt, who are continuing the prophetic task of speaking truth to power because their mentor was mentored by a mentor all the way back to people like Elijah and Elisha. And that's just the point. The work here is God's work. Elijah knew that and Elisha knew that. They were simply continuing the prophetic work of speaking truth to power that God had established centuries before and continues into this present day. Mentoring is the responsibility of all who claim God. For if we are to pass on the work that God has given us to do, we must raise up others who will come behind us, just as someone raised us up to take on the work we do or have done. This, in fact, is the model that Jesus set. He invested in 12 men. He spent the vast majority of his earthly ministry time with them, teaching them and training them, mentoring them. Eleven of them succeeded him to carry his mantle into the world, founding the church. And the very first thing they did after Jesus left them, rising up to heaven in ways reminiscent of Elijah in this story, was to select a replacement for Judas Iscariot. Then they mentored Matthias, that replacement, just as Jesus had mentored them. Twelve men mentored by one man. That's the model Jesus left us. And the world was changed and continues to be changed. 
It's the same model we see here between Elijah and Elisha. And the world was and continues to be changed. Mentoring matters. Mentoring is the example from Jesus Christ and from Elijah and Elisha for how to change the world. It's easy to imagine that at some point down the road, Elisha began to mentor his replacement, the person to whom he would give his mantle. We see that model all over scripture. Abraham mentoring his son Isaac, Moses mentoring Joshua, Jesus and the 12 disciples. In fact, discipleship itself is modeled on mentoring. Each of the 12 disciples picked up new disciples whom they mentored. Paul, after his Damascus Road experience, was mentored and then, upon taking on his ministry, mentored individuals like Apollos, Timothy, Silvanus, and Titus. As we have been mentored, so we go and mentor others. As we have picked up mantles, so we prepare others to whom we will give our mantle. Discipleship happens in relationship. Positive change in the world happens through mentorship. I have folks whom I have mentored and am currently mentoring, some for a season, especially when I was working in higher ed, and some for longer than that. It's a privilege to watch them grow, to see how God is using them in their careers, to discover a fresh and anew my own vocation and passion for it through their eyes. These relationships formed over time. They did not just begin with mentoring, but rather the relationship evolved to that point until trust was built and a common sense of purpose was realized. This is also how mentoring works. As we have been blessed by mentors in our life, so we are called to go and bless others in the same way. It's one of the grandest and most common motifs across Scripture. We are blessed to be a blessing. As God has blessed us, so we are called to go and offer that blessing to others. Mentoring is a primary way of doing that. Elijah and Elisha show us the example of the power of mentoring this morning both as the mentor in Elijah and the mentee in Elisha. And they demonstrate a pattern lived out across Scripture, a pattern we call today discipleship, where we are changed because we are in relationship with one another. Because change happens in relationship. Discipleship happens in relationship. This is God's work, for we are to pass on the work God has given us to do, raising up others who will come behind us, just as someone raised us up to take on the work we have done. Who are the mentors in your life? Even if they're now gone from this world, consider the legacy they left you. What mantle did they give you to carry? How did they positively shape your life? How are you better because of their presence in your life? And then, after considering this, who are the people you are mentoring? How are you investing in others who will take on your mantle when you retire and are gone? This is a challenge today. Consider who mentored you and whom you are mentoring. Make sure you have at least one person in your life who's investing in you and whom you are investing in. God uses those relationships to pass mantles, to pass legacies, so that God's work might continue in this world. A work first given to you by mentors, a work you carried on, and a work you will eventually hand over to someone else. And here's one additional challenge, a very tangible one. If your mentors are still among us, write them a card this week and let them know how much you appreciate them. We all know from experience, one of the best things to receive is such a card in the mail. And then write your mentees cards and tell them how proud you are of them. Spend time this week making that investment through writing cards. God has called upon us to mentor so that we might positively influence the world. Remembering that Jesus and then 12 men created a movement that changed the world, we remember that quality of relationship matters more than quantity of relationship. 
because it's God's work we are charged with. Like Elijah and Elisha, mentor others. Be mentored yourself. Pass on that mantle, that work that God has given us, and thereby change the world. As iron sharpens iron, so we sharpen each other. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. table of Jesus Christ in the United Methodist Church, all who claim the name of Jesus Christ and who earnestly repent of their sins are invited to come and receive at this table regardless of what denomination or lack thereof you may be affiliated with. Hear these words of invitation. Christ our Lord invites to this his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke to us through prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hands. Give us this day our daily bread, 
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we, by the strength of your spirit, may go to give ourselves for others. In Christ's name, amen. This time I invite Anna Pollard to come forward to join the church by confession of faith. Many of you already know Anna. Uh, she has been with us since the end of July as our administrative assistant and has taken on a lot of hospitality coordination uh, roles as well. We are grateful for Anna's presence with us at church. Uh, but she has discerned and felt a call to join the church here. And so we are uh, grateful for that opportunity this morning. So, Anna, as a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If you will say, I will. And as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in, the, in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, if you will say, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend Anna to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her in, her in hope, and perfect her in love, and respond as printed in your bulletin. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you. who has called you, us, to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Welcome. Now let's stand and join together in singing our final hymn. Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. 
May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.